Okay, so the mystery of the pins was solved. We have them now. Uh, today will probably be a little bit short uh, because, uh, well, at first I was concerned we didn't have enough time. Today's the 29th. Uh, I was concerned that we were starting to get about a lecture, uh, half a lecture behind. And then I was worried, oh, we're getting behind, we're getting behind. And then, um, then the other instructors pointed out, uh, no, you look, it looks like you're half a lecture be ahead, actually. Uh, and, that, and then trying to figure out why, it's because, it's because last semester when I did exactly this thing, I changed the syllabus so that we would, ha we would, we would have two days for section 2.7. <laughs> so, good, <laughs> here we are. So there's not a lot to talk about today. That's fine, though. Uh, we'll, still, we'll still do things. Um, let's do a little bit more inequalities, and then we'll get started on section 3.1, the, the, new, the new section. So last time, last time we talked about linear inequalities and absolute value inequalities. So let's do a couple more of those. So how about let's consider this one for a moment. Mm, absolute value, 4x plus 5 divided by 6 is, say, less or equal to uh, 9. So whenever you're faced with an absolute value inequality, you should always ask yourself, um, is it possible in principle for this inequality to be satisfied? And what I mean is you, you, can, you can ask yourself that question in this way. Just cover that up and ask, is there anything that I could reveal so that the inequality would be true? Is there any number that would satisfy it? So what's, what's one number that would satisfy it? 8, Eight would work. 8.9 would work. What's the biggest number that would work? 9. 9.1 Nine. Nine would simply be too big. Okay. What's the smallest number that would work? How about, could we plug in negative 20? Could, would, it, would it work? Would the inequality be true if I were to reveal a negative 20? So it, it wouldn't work if I, if I revealed it and it was a negative 20 because what's the absolute value of negative 20? 20, which isn't less than or equal to 9. So what's the smallest number I could possibly reveal? Not, not what would the smallest number be after this. What I mean is negative 9. That's the smallest thing that I could reveal. So whatever, whatever uh, is in there, it's surely got to be between the, between the nines. That is to say, on the one hand, to the right of negative nine, and on the other hand, to the left of positive nine. So it's got to be like this. Oops. So that's, that's what I mean. It's got to be between the nines. OK, so what do we need to do now? What do you think? Multiply all positions, yeah, by 6. So in inequalities, sometimes multiplication gets weird. That is to say, in with inequality, sometimes multiplication requires you to reverse the direction of the inequality. How about this time? No, it, not this time. Why not this time? <laughs> it's a little rainy. It's a Friday. <laughs> not, not good buy-in into the class right now. <laughs> okay, so we're going to multiply all positions by 6, and it does not reverse the direction of the inequality because 6 is positive. So negative 54 less or equal 4x plus 5 less or equal 54. OK, now what? Subtract 5. So negative 59 less or equal 4x 
less or equal uh, 49. Now what? Divide by 4. So negative, uh, how many 4s go in there? Uh, 10, and then another 4, and then 3. So 14.75. And then that's less or equal x, less or equal, and then this divided by 4 is 12 and a quarter, like so. Okay, so then please write that in interval notation. Okay, so then that would be negative 14.75, including that, and to 12.25, including that. So any question about uh, this one? All right. Yes? If I, uh, if I had written it as bracket negative 14.75, x parentheses, then include another one with parentheses, x comma uh, 12.25 bracket, Mm -hmm. That would be incorrect, be because in interval notation must be exactly must be exactly one of these either a b a b a b a b negative infinity b negative infinity b a infinity a infinity. This is all the all the possibilities. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay. So then, uh, now to understand why, v visually, geometrically, why it should be this way, uh, let's let's do that real quick. So again, uh, to simplify our lives just a little bit, I'll call everything in there a single name. Uh, call it W. So this is like absolute value W less or equal 9. So then from the left hand side we'll consider Y is absolute value W and from the right hand side Y is 9. And I'll plot these in colors red and green. So the red thing is absolute value. This vertical axis is the y-axis. What is this horizontal axis? Is w, right? Because we're not, we're not talking about, to simplify our lives, instead of looking at an expression kind of complicated like that, instead of looking at it like that, I'm just going to call it w. So what is the characteristic shape of absolute value? Uh, yeah, a v. So it looks like that, that, okay, and then when you plot uh, y is 9, how does that look? Horizontal line, and how is it with respect to the origin? Above. Okay, so then uh, we plotted the red and the green thing. Um, the, the next question is, is do the red and the green thing intersect anywhere? They do, right? They intersect twice, in fact. So here's one of the intersections, and there's the other. As for the intersection on the right, what input, W, what W input would cause this intersection? Nine, right? Because, because, uh, this line, this green horizontal line is y is 9, and then the question is, is, well, what could you put in for that w so that the absolute value of it would be 9? Well, 9 would work. What else would work? Negative 9 would work. Okay, so now we've plotted the two 
sides. We've plotted the intersections, and now we just need to ask ourselves what is the inequality uh, saying. So now, would some brave person please, using the words red, green, above, below, between, and things like that, would someone please uh, say out loud what this is requesting? Red below green. So where is red below green? Well, if you start way over here, at this point, for example, this is like maybe negative 15 or something like that. Uh, we have this green point is here and that red point is there. Green and red. Is red below green? No. No, so that's not part of the solution over there. Uh, how about this point right here? So this is something like maybe negative 2. We have, there's the input. The red output is there. The green output is there. Is red below green here? It is. Do you observe that red is below green between the nines. Red is below green between the nines. And do we pick up the nines themselves? Yes. yes, because it says less or equal. So the fact that the picture is showing you that red is below green between the nines, and algebraically the thing that you're working for is between the nines, can you see the correspondence? Good. Any question about this example? Okay. Uh, what about what about uh, one like this? Um, the absolute value of five minus two x over three is less or equal to negative 2. Okay. So, will this one be just like the previous one between the twos? The, the previous one was between the nines. Will this one be between the twos? What will this one be? Yeah, so let's let every time you, you see one of these, you need to ask yourself, well, suppose that I just cover that up for a moment and, and consider all the things that I could possibly reveal under there. Uh, is there something that you could put in there so that um, the equation, so that the inequality would be true? Is there something you could put inside of that absolute value so that what would come out is less than or equal to negative 2. There is nothing you could put in there. There's nothing you could possibly put in there, so what's the correct response? No solution. So, so that's the answer to the question, that there's no solution. Now, geometrically, why should it be this way? Well, again, if we consider absolute value w less or equal to negative 2, and we make the left-hand side y is absolute value w, and the right-hand side y is negative 2, and then if we plot these in the left-hand side in red, and the right-hand side in green, Well, the characteristic shape of absolute value is a V with its point at the origin. So this is Y is absolute value W. And then Y is negative 2 looks like this. It's a horizontal line, but it is below the origin. And then the question we need to ask is would someone please say out loud in plain language what this inequality is requesting. Yeah. Where is, please tell me all the locations where red is below green. <laughs> List them out for me. None, right? There aren't any. Nowhere is red below green. That's why the answer is that there is no solution. 
Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, one last one before we go to new topic. Uh, how about... <clears throat> How about 3 plus x uh, greater than 7x minus 2 greater than 5x minus 10. OK. So this is the first time we've done one like this. Now. We've done ones like, ones like this, that is to say inequality chains, where there's three positions. We've done that before. But what's different about this one as opposed to the previous ones? Yeah, all the positions have x's. Whereas before, like on the previous pa uh, two pages ago, here we had an inequality chain but only the middle position had x's. So that's the, that's the main uh, distinction between these two, is that this one, this new one, all positions have an x, and the, the previous ones, only the, only the middle position had x. Well, how do we, how do we deal with it? Do what? Group all of the x's together. Well, let's think about that. Could, could, could you do that? So if, this, if that were the inequality, what would you do? Right, you could add 2. You could add 2 to both sides. And then you could maybe subtract 1x to get that x to move over to be buddies with that one. Right? So ignoring the constants for a minute, and just looking at the x's, if, if this were the inequality, you'd want to subtract an x, 1x. Whereas if that were the inequality, what would you want to do? You'd want to subtract 5x's. So this one is saying, in a sense, let's subtract 5. That one is saying, let's subtract 1. So because they're not saying the same thing, you're not able to do it all at once. You're not able to do it all at once, so there's only one way to proceed. There's only one way to proceed, and that is we have to split this inequality chain into its component inequalities. That is to say, we'll, I'll name this one the red one, the green one, and the blue one. And we have to split this into two in the following kind of way. That on the one hand, we need this one to be true. We need that one to be true. That's when you take just these two. And at the same time as that one, We need this one to be true. So the other kind, the previous kind, was kind of nicer <laughs> because you could do it all at the same time. But these, this kind is a little less friendly because you've got to do them separately. OK, so now let's do this one alone. So what do you want to do for this one? Subtract an x. Okay, supposing we do that, then the left-hand side is 3, and then greater than 6x minus 2. And now what? Add 2. Add 2. So 5 greater than 6x. And then divide by 6. So 5 sixths greater than x. Okay. So we solved the left one. So now let's solve this one. So for this one now, 
what should we do? Subtract 5x. Okay, so then we would have 2x minus 2 greater than 10. Then what? Uh, negative 10, thank you. Uh, now what? Add 2. So 2x greater than negative 8. And then divide by 2. So x greater than negative 4. Okay. So now, uh, usually students do a little better if x is, all, is on the left. So, so this one's fine because x is on the left, but I'm going to reorder this one so that x is on the left. If I wanted to write x on the left, then it would look like x is there, 5 sixths is here, and then what? Like that one, right? <laughs> the alligator is eating the five sixths. Okay, <laughs> that's what that's what my teacher told me back in the day. Uh, so what we want is both of these have to be true. Both of these have to be true. So what's the? So how do we write this? An interval notation. Well, let's think about it for a moment. If you're having difficulty, on the one hand, we want x less than 5 sixths. Well, let's plot what that looks like. And also x greater than negative 4. Let's plot what that looks like. So x less than 5 sixths. We've got these two points here, 5 sixths and negative 4. Which one is further to the left? Negative four. So negative four is like right here. And then five sixths is somewhere over here. And this one is saying, this one is saying, on the one hand, we want it to be less than or equal to, or sorry, just strictly less than five sixths. So all of this is good for the first one. All of that's good for the first one. And then what do we want for the second one? Greater. greater than, right? So, so this represents everything that satisfies the first inequality. This represents everything that satisfies the second inequality. My question to you is, is what satisfies both inequalities? Yeah, the stuff in between the stuff in between. So in interval notation, what's the answer? To 5 sixths. Very good. Any question about this one? OK, so then I'll omit doing the geometry one, because I can see from the coefficients the numbers would be too much. But in the end, do uh, you have a question? Instead of this one, well, they're, they're, the, these two statements right here are identical. I'm just, but it's just my observation that students seem to do better, seem to respond more accurately when I when you write the x on the left. I can only speculate as to why. <laughs> uh, really, because. You know, I try and figure out what's going on in everyone's head, but, but that one is a mystery, right? So then for this one, it, it looks to me like, well, 5 6 is bigger than x. So x must be smaller than 5 6. I don't know. They're exactly the same to me for some reason. But for students, I can tell you, statistically, these two statements do not, students do not respond to them as if, they're, as if they are identical, but even, even though they are. That, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> ah, but if we if we were to plot this, then we could plot a line. Y is three plus x. This is a line that slopes up with y intercept three. Slopes up with slope one, uh, and y intercept three. This one is one that slopes up with slope seven, and y intercept negative two. And this is one that slopes up with slope five and y intercept negative ten. So all of these lines are sloping up. 
this line slopes up at the least rate, this one at the greatest rate, and this one at an intermediate rate, and they're all kind of sloping. And the question is, is where are they in this order? Red is the highest, green is the second highest, blue is the lowest. So where are they? And the answer is between these. But the, the graph, the, the, the plot of all of it is, I think, probably too much to try and draw by hand. Which is why algebraic techniques are good, right? Because even without having to know what it looks like, we still were able to do it. Uh, good. So now we're in, <coughs> pardon me, section 3.1. So we're in chapter 3. We're now leaving chapter 2, and we've made it to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is about functions. And the name of section 3.1 is, appropriately enough, functions. Actually, it's not. <laughs> but I'm just going to call it that because I don't really care for the name they chose in the book. So, <clears throat> um, the first thing we're going to talk about is something else, <laughs> a relation. So a relation is a mapping. From one set, D, called the domain, to another set, R called the range. Range. Okay, so for example, uh, we could have just symbolically here, I'll sim symbolize the set D, and it's going to contain the number 1, 3, the number 1, 4 and uh, the symbol triangle. I'm only writing triangle just so you don't think that we could only possibly be talking about numbers. So I'll put a sh just throw a shape in there. And then the range is something like uh, one, two, five, and um, 27. Okay, so we've got domain and range. And then, so this is the set that we're calling the domain, this is the set that we're calling the range, and the relation is uh, essentially it's a mapping from elements in the domain to elements in the range and we'll symbolize it with arrows. So 13 is related to 5 and maybe also 13 is related to 2. Uh, perhaps 14 is uh, only related to 1. And triangle surely is related to 27. Okay. So this is an example of a relation. And I could ask, what is 13 related to? 2 and 5. Two and five. Okay, good. <clears throat> Now, you might think, well, this is pretty abstract. How, why, why, would the, why would we possibly be talking about this? Okay, well, here's, here's an example reason. Um, there's, a, there's a company that you may have heard of, and their name is uh, the Alphabet Company, actually, now. Who am I talking about? Google, right? Everybody knows Google, but they recently reformulated themselves into a company called Alphabet, and Alphabet actually owns Google now. Uh, at any rate, you've heard of Google. Uh, Google makes just, I think it's probably literally true to say, dump truck fools uh, of money. So what, what's happening here is that you're the product. You're Google's product. 
And what, what happens is, is that when you want to find something on the internet, you know, you type, you know, show me a cat playing a piano into the search bar. And, and then just like that, hundreds of videos of cats playing pianos show up on, in the web browser. Well, Google is performing a computation on what you're asking to show you all the different pages where it thinks there's a good chance of a cat playing a piano or if you're looking for truck parts or what have you. Okay, so that's very useful to you. But here's the thing, is that people who sell truck parts or people who sell cats who know how to play pianos, <laughs> I don't know, are really interested. If you're searching for that, then maybe you could buy some of their stuff. So, so such folks pay Google money that every time you, t you type cat playing a piano, if somehow their good or service is related to that, then Google shows you, oh, did you know that these people uh, sell pianos that are compatible with your cat? Okay, so then, so that's Google's business model. You're the product. Okay, you're the product because you keep going back to Google because what they're doing in real time is they're making a relation. That's what they're doing. They're saying that, oh, look, they asked for cat playing a piano. Here's two different sites about cats playing piano. And they, they tell you about two, and they tell you about five, and they also tell you about Bob's cat playing piano emporium. <laughs> That's how they're making money. Okay, so relation is not so, um, is not, is not so abstract of an idea. It, 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 you use one every day. Similarly, the, the, oh, your friends list in Facebook, that's a, re, that's a relation. And Facebook also is making money in, in, you know, by the metric ton because they're also selling advertisements. Okay, we're going to be talking about a specific uh, kind of relation called a, called a function. So a function is a relation where each element in the domain maps to exactly one element of the range. Okay, so what that means is that if we were to do an arrow drawing like we did up here, that means that there has to be exactly one arrow leaving every element in the domain. There has to be exactly one. So uh, this relation that I drew, all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. So is this relation a function? No, it's not. Why is this relation not a function? 13 goes to 2 and 5. Right. 13 goes to 2 and 5. Two arrows leave 13. So this is not a function. OK, so, so uh, for example, if this is the domain and this the range, uh, maybe the domain is 1, 2, 3, and the range is um, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And I'm only doing that because I don't want you to think that the same number of elements need to be in domain and range. So we'll say that 1 goes to 8, 2 goes to 10, 3 goes to 7, and I guess nothing goes to 9, but that's fine. Because the only requirement is that exactly one arrow is leaving everything in the domain. So uh, is this a function? It is a function. So now, for your conceptual model of what a function is, I want you to think of it like a machine that you you know, you can think of it like a machine with two sides. This is the input side, and that's the output side. 
and if you if you put an input if you push an input in on the input side then something should come out on the output side so I have a question suppose that over here on the input side we push in a 2 then what should come out on the other side a 10 right you push the two in and you hear all kinds of sounds like a saw like you know and then out comes a 10 yeah exactly okay good uh, so what would happen if you pushed in uh, say like a 12 yeah the machine would just blow up right it would it would just blow up because 12 isn't part of the domain Okay, so, so the machine doesn't have a defined behavior for that. Okay, good. So, the most common kind of function that we deal with in this class is the following kind, called functions defined by expressions. So a function can be defined by an expression. If the domain is not explicitly specified, Explicitly uh, specified, then the domain is the natural domain of the expression. Okay, so this is kind of standard math language. <laughs> Very formal and stilted and everything. Kind of like, makes you feel like you might need a lawyer. <laughs> okay, so th let's try and make this clear. Uh, let's try and make this clear with some examples. So suppose that we have a function f, and it's going to be defined as f of x is x squared plus 1 on the interval 2 to 9. So what I mean, what I mean is I'm talking about a, a, a machine and its name is F and what it does is if you push in an X what comes out on the other side is an x squared plus 1. So suppose that I request of you uh, please evaluate F at 5. So what is it that I'm requesting? Five times five squared plus one. Right. So then f at five, well, that would be replace all the x's with five, five squared plus one. That'd be a 26. So in the machine concept, it is like we've got an f machine here. We put a five into it. Who knows what happens, right? Saws and cats screaming and everything else. And then out comes a 26. Yeah. Okay, then, uh, well, what about, so what about F at three, say? Ten. ten. So F of three is ten for reasons that I hope are becoming clear. So how about what is F of, um, what's F of thirteen? I agree entirely that, a, that 13 squared plus 1 is 170. I agree entirely. But the answer is not 170. Right. It, it's not in the domain. Right. This bit is the domain. So what this is saying is that this is the set of permissible inputs. So the answer is that this is undefined. Now. 
some students get get a little bit weirded out here when when they say no i'm pretty sure i really can plug in 13 into x squared plus one i don't dispute that but the thing is that we've said that this function is defined by that expression only on this set this is the domain so what happens is is this is the f machine here's the f machine and if you try and put a 13 into it then what happens is that it just explodes right boom not part of the domain. <clears throat> Good. Any question about this? Yes? So then 9 is undefined. Right. Okay. It is undefined at 9 because 9 is not part of that set. Okay. How about this function? Uh, let's give it a different name than f because not all functions need to be named f. How about, uh, how about s of x? is the square root of x. So my first question of you is that what is s evaluated at, uh, say, 16? Well, now you have to come to, the, to, the, to this thing. If the domain is not explicitly specified, then the domain is the natural domain of the expression defining it. So, it's a good question. What is, what is the natural domain of the square root? Well, okay. So the answer to this one is four. So if you plug in a 16, you get a four. But w so now I'll ask the question, what is the domain of S? This, this, is, this is, so on, this is only reals because the rule in this class is that everything is real unless it is explicitly said that we're talking about complex. So, so, what's the domain of S? All real, except, for the except for the negatives, right? You can't use the negatives. So it would be zero to infinity. So now I have a question for you. For a few times, several times this semester, I've said that the square root of 16 is four. It's not plus or minus 4, it's 4. I agree entirely that when you square negative 4, you get 16. I make no dispute. But negative 4 is not the square root of 16. 4 is. Now, can someone tell us why is it the case that the square root can only be 4? Or, or not even avoiding that, why, can't, why, is it, why could it not be correct to say that the square root of 16 is, plus, is, is 4 or negative 4? Because it's an even number. Because of what? The rules of, the func of, of what it means to be a function, right? How many arrows can leave 16? Just one. And if you say that the square root of 16 is positive 4 or negative 4, that's saying that there's two arrows leaving 16. It's not a function if you do that. So, so you have to choose. You've got to make a choice. Either we're going to say that square roots are, all, are, are always positive or always negative. So the choice is, okay, when we're talking about square roots, we're always talking about the positive one because we want square root to be function. Okay, have a nice weekend. Thank <laughs> you.